Good evening, I'm Mike Kinetter and welcome to our UW Now live stream series where we bring you experts from the UW community to talk about various aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. Tonight's program is going to take up the issue of the future of commercial and residential real estate. And we have two uh, distinguished graduates of our Wisconsin real estate program, uh, students of the storied professor, Jim Grasscamp. So uh, we have with us tonight, Mark Epley, who is now the director of the Grasscamp Center for Real Estate in the Wisconsin School of Business, and Jill Hatton, who is an institutional real estate investment expert with a wide range of industry experience. And they will each give a brief presentation, which will be followed by our usual format of audience Q&A and occasionally testy moderator Q&A, okay? <laughs> so uh, our first speaker tonight is gonna be Mark Epley. Uh, Mark is a three-time graduate of UW-Madison and the director of the Grass Camp Center for Real Estate. Previously, Mark served as the interim dean of business and also held the bell chair in real estate at Marquette University. That is the only time I'll refer to another university in this <laughs> broadcast. Um, but uh, that said, um, Mark's had a, a very distinguished career as a real estate faculty member, widely published in commercial uh, real estate finance, development and valuation. He's an independent board member of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago He's the immediate past president of the nonprofit Real Estate Research Institute. And Mark has been recognized by the Greater Washington Urban League and the Urban Land Institute for his efforts to increase diversity in the real estate profession. Mark, it is great to have you back at Wisconsin and it's great to have you on our show tonight. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts about the future of the real estate market. Mark Epley. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm delighted to be back at the Great State University of Wisconsin as a uh, first generation college educated student, um, as a native of Wisconsin, as a passionate Badger. I'm also be delighted to be on this, uh, this podcast. So uh, Jill and I have a relatively short period of time to make some, some presentation comments. So we'll keep it at a pretty high level. Um, so please be uh, prepared to give us some of your, your detailed questions as we go along. So um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so um, the, the next slide <laughs> uh, kind of goes to uh, what 2020 is turning out to be. We didn't see it coming. We just wanted to get over with it. And hopefully we never will set our uh, uh, time machine to uh, 2020. So with that said, though, let's, uh, let's go a, a slide ahead and start talking about where we were before uh, 2020 in, in the COVID uh, uh, pandemic hit. So let's talk about the commercial real estate market. And when we start talking about the commercial real estate market and, and the position it was in, um, we can start talking about the supply of, of space. And that's really from construction. And for the most part, over the last five years, we're at about 350 billion a year. Vacancy rates, stable. What's what we call cap rates, first year property cash flow returns, pretty stable to falling slightly, meaning property values are going up, transaction volume stable. Uh, as well as property appreciation growing at reasonable rates of, uh, of growth or appreciation, maybe two to 3%. And there was an abundance of debt and equity capital sources, maybe too much. So in short, um, in quick overview form, the commercial real estate markets are really kind of in a Goldilocks place going into the, uh, the pandemic, um, maybe with some bumpiness for retail and hospitality sectors. So um, real estate, to be clear, is in a very different place today than it was in 2007 uh, when the real estate uh, and, and financial uh, crisis hit and, and ultimately turned into the, to the Great Recession. So I think that's an important place to start. Let's go to the next slide. So when we start looking, we go from pre-COVID to COVID arrives. We call it a black swan event. It's something we don't expect. Um, and when we start looking at this, it was, it's a pandemic. And at this point, you know, doctors could tell you better uh, the, the, the path of the economy, uh, the economy than economists. So simply put, economic growth will be the inverse of the coronavirus infection rates. And, um, and, and, and therefore, we're somewhat at a loss as economists to guess the direction of things. But I think it's helpful to talk about a couple of responses um, that really have made a difference on the commercial real estate market. The first one, the $3.3 trillion in, in fiscal um, response. It's large, it came swiftly, 
and it seems relatively well deployed. Certainly there are some concerns about it going in the wrong places and such, but overall, I think they've done a very good job. Taxpayers receive 1200 bucks plus 500 for their kids. There's a $600 weekly unemployment benefit bonus, as well as you know the, the Employer Paycheck Protection Program. Um, from there, monetary uh, response. Um, uh, the Federal Reserve, to my mind, had tremendous timing when they, when they uh, really infused the markets with liquidity the week of March 16th. Um, we were having any number of risk management and other meetings at the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago that week um, as we saw liquidity dry, dry up. And we saw it both at the member bank level where um, some of our member banks saw uh, folks pull up into their uh, drive throughs and, and ask for $10,000 in cash and withdraw it. So we started seeing liquidity dry up at the banks, but also institutionally we saw in, um, liquidity dry up. Um, and the liquidity was swift, it was large. As a matter of fact, the liquidity that was received in the matter of about two or three weeks was greater than all three of the quantitative easing steps that the Federal Reserve took uh, to ease the Great Recession. Um, uh, so, uh, so with that said, let's take a look at what this COVID um, uh, uh, recession might look like. The best analogy I have is 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 the uh, terror attacks of 9/11. So, what happened in 9/11? It, it hit unexpectedly, a little bit like the pandemic. At, after 9/11, we had this uh, collective concern. Uh, same with the impact of COVID, although it's a little longer and a little more real. Um, and I believe the, um, the, the, the responses to it will be similar. So what happened with 9-11 uh, was we, we, we fixed the, um, the, the doors, we secured airplane doors, and we, we also have a security to go into uh, buildings. And the same thing will happen with COVID. We will get a vaccine and we'll continue to social distance at, at some, some level. So um, I think when you start looking at this is a good analogy uh, when we start looking at it, um, uh, to go from 9-11 um, uh, uh, to what we're, we're talking about here. Um, but I think one of the challenges we have, and this is a big difference, is President Bush came on the TV and said he told us to be patriotic after 9-11. He said, be strong, America, go out and, and, and live your way of life and go out and spend. In this pandemic, it's very different. To be patriotic, we hole up and uh, self-isolate. And so it'll take a while to get out of that. That's why the recovery won't be a V-shape. It'll be more of a Nike swoosh shape, as many economists are suggesting. Let's go to the next slide and start looking into the future and look in and think about what might happen from a city perspective or urban areas. So um, I, I remain rather bullish on cities. Let's give a couple of quick background uh, comments. First off, about 250 million of the 330 million people in the United States live in urban areas uh, on 3% of the land. So, and additionally and importantly, these folks are 30% more than their counterparts in rural America. So they earn 30% more. Um, and cities are places where talent and firms cluster and they learn from each other. And I think that'll continue. If you really start thinking about uh, what Amazon did with uh, HQ2, their, their second headquarter, they had 238 applicants um, in 54 different states, provinces, and, and, and areas uh, to locate HQ2. And what did they choose? They choose, chose the two most expensive, or among the two most expensive cities uh, in the United States with, with New York City and, and Washington, D.C. It goes to that importance of cities as places where um, the best and the brightest desperately want to be around the best and, and the brightest and be engaged in that way. <clears throat> um, so like I say, cities and firms cluster together um, and that's kind of the old school way of looking at urban economics is, 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 is um, we set up a, 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 a company and people go there. Now what's happening more often than not is people choose, talent chooses the cities they want to be. So what do they start to look for when they choose these places? Places where their minds are engaged, where they're, where they're provided life experiences. Um, and those are, 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 the, are the big cities. Uh, and, and when we get to those uh, uh, experiences, it comes down to, you know, going to the theater, going to a major league baseball game, going to a Badger hockey or football or basketball game, or even just going to that corner uh, market um, for a, 
margarita, the corner taqueria. So these are really important. So it's these experiences that we can get in big cities that we oftentimes can't get easily in smaller cities. And also they have a wonderful um, set of diversity and I would say inclusion as well. It's, it's places I think of a far greater tolerance in most cases. And, and one of the reasons is we learn to appreciate other, other cultures and other foods uh, in the process. But this also does presume that we will have a vaccine uh, and some degree of social uh, spacing uh, as, we, uh, as, we go, as we go along. Um, so from there, let's go on to the next slide. And let's look at the immediate impacts uh, on commercial real estate. So we went from the, the impact of COVID to bigger picture. We think cities will, will continue to thrive. Uh, we can talk about that more in the Q&A. But let's look at the immediate impacts. Uh, much of this will be discussed in greater detail in, in, in Jill's presentation. But in May 2020, the transaction volume for commercial real estate was down 78% from May of, 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 of 2019. Um, when we start looking at the different property types, we'll, um, both industrial or warehouse and apartments will snap back pretty well. They were fairly well leased before, fairly good demand. Retail and hospitality will not. Office is a wild card. And like I say, Jill will give you a, a, a better sense of that. A um, couple of statements about the retail markets. So when we start looking at retail, um, uh, as of May's data, only 55% of national tenants were paying rent and 45% of local tenants were paying rent, putting tremendous pressure on landlords to then make payments on their debt. Um, and, and in a similar way, when we start looking at retail from the um, Simon Property Group, as you might have heard, Simon and Properties in the market to possibly buy JCPenney and operate them. And this is far less about operating JCPenney and far more about maintaining their mall because most mall leases have what they call co-tenancy uh, clauses, whereby if one of the anchor tenants move out, the other tenants can move out as well. And so they need to keep those big Macy's and uh, Nordstrom's and Neiman Marcus and, and, and JCPenney's uh, in, in their stores. It's a, it's a big deal. It's gonna create continued stress in that marketplace. Let's go on to uh, slide seven, which is really the last slide I have on commercial real estate. And this one really goes to the pricing of commercial real estate uh, today. Um, and so when we look at the pricing of real estate, the blue line on top is what we call the cap rate. It's the current yield or cash flow yield on, on real estate. And you'll start to see that um, it was, you know, you got an eight or 9% return uh, into the 90s, but boy, by about 2007, it dipped to about 6%, which is where we are today. If we look at that line alone or in isolation, you go, wow, we're, we're, we've got this pricing that's just like it was in 2007. Should we be concerned? In isolation, you might say yes. But now let's compare it to um, uh, the, the uh, rate of return on 10-year treasuries, the risk-free rate for a 10-year instrument or investment. And you'll start to see that um, the 10-year treasury rate has come down across time and more or less stabilized over the last decade or so with a little bit of noise. If you start looking at 2007 or so, you'll, you'll note that the spread, and that's the difference between the return on real estate and the treasury rate, reduced to about 1%. That historic rate is about a 3% average. And right now where we are, we're at 4.5% or so. So we're not priced tightly around real estate. What I'm trying to show here is that big gray area means that we've got some cushion, some risk cushion over and above treasuries with commercial real estate and how we're, we're pricing it today. So it looks like it's fairly well, well priced. Let's go on. So, and let's start looking at the, um, the residential uh, macro market for a little bit. Once again, before COVID and COVID on this, on this slide. So before COVID, now look at instead of the five years for commercial residential, I'll look at maybe the last three years. But roughly speaking, nationally, we had sales about 5.4 million units a year. It, but what has happened over the last 18 months as the month's supply of new housing um, for sale housing, that is, dropped from about four to four and a half to close to three, which means it went from a seller's market deeply into a seller's market. In other words, there weren't many, many units uh, in inventory per each uh, a purchaser. A, a norm, normal market would be about 5.5 months of supply. So we had a shortage of units. 
if you look at um, the, the the research on this, Freddie uh, Freddie Mac and and the Joint Centers for Housing Studies, we probably have a shortage of, of, of housing units of, of two and a half to three and a half million or about two years worth of construction. This is a big deal. And the, and the reason for that is the four L's. Lots, we don't have um, uh, enough uh, lots to build on. Labor has moved from, from, from construction to other areas. Legislation, it takes longer to build lots in, in, in houses. And then lumber, lumber's come around in a good way. So what we're gonna see, um, what we were seeing is a solid appreciation um, and, and wealth, um, wealth and income inequalities as those who have a house continue to do well and those who don't um, uh, aren't. So, so it gives you a sense of where we are today. As we start looking into the macro, uh, the, the COVID market now, um, what you'll start to see though is um, uh, a market where 28% of people uh, applied for first-time unemployment benefits. And if you're applying for 20 for, for first-time unemployment benefits, it's 45 million people, by the way, um, the likelihood you're going to go and apply for a mortgage is pretty low. That said, of those 45 million workers that applied for first-time benefits, 84% um, uh, were temporary layoffs. So it's hard to guess what that really looks like. But all in all, not a good sign. Uh, from there, um, the credit box is tightening as well. So Freddie and Fannie, as well as Ginny May, are all tightening down their credit box a little bit, uh, at a little lower debt to income ratio, so you can't have as, as high a debt service payment to your income. Your credit scores are being pushed a little bit higher, and they're looking more closely at, at, at loan to values and appraisal and are being more picky about things. And then, and then finally, what's happened is, um, in today's Wall Street Journal, as you might have noted, is there are 100 million credit accounts in the United States that have been deferred. And with that many credit accounts deferred, it makes a, a credit score, a FICO score, really hard to interpret. It makes it hard for that, that the credit to be, to be distributed. Um, what we're starting to see, and, and as uh, data from the National Association of Home Builders presents, is that, that, that we'll probably see a, about a 30% drop in new home constructions this year. Um, and that'll put a lot of pressure on, on the longer term market for homes. So we really need more homes and we're gonna see even fewer this year because of COVID. Let's go to one more slide on residential and then I'll summarize uh, things up for you here. So when we start looking at residential and the impact post COVID, um, and which would be the medium to long term, with the short term being uncertain to risky, um, what's really gonna drive this is demographics. And a um, couple of things worth noting with demographics. So first off, millennials, they're marrying five to six years later for men and women than they did in, in, in 1980. They're having children later. Um, but that said, millennials still want to get married. They still want to have kids. They still want to buy a home and they're deferring all that. So what's happening is instead of the prime years for first time home buyers being in the late 20s, it's going to be in the early 30s. And what I prevent present to you here is the peak millennial cohorts, which are over 4 million in population each year, are the years 2019, 20, 21, and 22. So that's when they'll turn 30, which will make them prime buyers. It'll really create a continued demand for um, uh, housing. And the second one is really interesting, and it might sound odd at first, but um, we're moving and are um, uh, uh, migrating at the lowest rates since they started keeping the data in 1947. Homeowners, um, are uh, only 5% of homeowners moved uh, in last year, or in the 2018-19 season. Uh, in the past, it was closer to 9.8 to almost 10%. So about one in 10 moved, now it's one in 20. What's happening is empty nesters are aging in place and not selling their house. Uh, from there, um, the supply, uh, we are have a, a significant shortage of, of, of for sale housing and a dearth of new housing, which will create uh, additional pressures. This combination will start to create um, what I would consider um, some real asset pricing challenges and, and inflation in, in uh, housing uh, in the coming five years. So um, let's go on to, the, uh, to, the, to, to my final slide before I hand it back to Mike. And um, so what will change? So first off, I don't know about you all, I'd ask you to think about this, um, but I know I want to go out and live my pre-COVID life. 
I want to go out and, and experience uh, and have, have a whole series of experiences. Retail went from buying soft good items to experiences. I want to go back to having that again. I believe most will want to have that. That will be most easily presented in cities as such cities will continue to, to survive. When we start looking at commercial real estate more directly, um, what we have is we have a lot of debt and equity that's sitting right one step away from being deployed. So while they're, they're stepping back a little bit, I think they'll step right back into the market uh, such that the, 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 the um, volatility in the pricing is likely to be uh, um, um, muted. Um, so in short, commercial real estate will enter into part the COVID recession in a relatively good place, um, not including hospitality and retail, those two different property types. Um, one group that might really succeed from this is obviously I think people will continue to go to big cities, but those who want to have, um, who want to get out of the big cities, there's been a pretty big push for these second tier cities such as Portland, such as Salt Lake City, such as um, uh, uh, Nashville as, as reasonable places where you can still um, uh, cluster knowledge base. And so in short, I think commercial real estate will do fairly well through this as it was in a good place before the recession. Um, and when it comes to us uh, uh, residential, I think it'll be closer to a bump in the night and we'll pretty much forget that this happened um, by, the, by the end of the year. That's it for me, Mike. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Mark, uh, for kicking things off tonight. Um, our next guest is Jill Hatton, and Jill has 35 years of institutional real estate investment experience. She retired from BlackRock in 2008, where she held the position of managing director for account management, and prior to that held various management and leadership roles within BlackRock real estate and its predecessor companies, including serving as president and CEO of GE Capital Investment Advisors. Jill currently serves on a number of boards. Those would include the Mass Prim Real Estate and Timber Committee, and she previously chaired the Investment Committee here at the University of Wisconsin Foundation. She is also a commissioner of the Boston Zoning Commission. Please send your complaints for Boston's infrastructure to Jill. Um, in 2010, Jill received the Distinguished Real Estate Alumnus Award from the Wisconsin School of Business. And uh, as mentioned, Jill is also a Badger, receiving her bachelor's and master's degrees from the business school and served as a teaching assistant under Professor James Grasscamp, uh, the chief, where she had Mark Epley as a student. So we've come full circle, Jill. We look forward to your remarks and your grades for Mark's presentation. Take it away. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. It's great. Uh, great to see you, Mike. And thanks to you and the entire foundation staff for keeping us all connected with these uh, podcast webcasts. I think they've been fabulous. And I also wanted to say thank you to Mark for your comments. Um, it's great to see him again. And it's also humbling to participate uh, with such a great thought leader in the real estate industry. He was a fabulous student right from the beginning. I can attest to that. And uh, he has continued to be a leader in our industry. And the UW Real Estate Program is very fortunate to have Professor Epley uh, leading the charge. So this is a, this is a great opportunity and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, I think I'd like to just kick off with a little bit of a tribute to the chief. Uh, he, one of his, uh, one of his uh, items that's my favorite, most memorable, relevant uh, piece that uh, is, is continues to be relevant today is his fundamentals of real estate development. And I'm not going to read this quote, but 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 clearly he he really embedded in all of his students the uh, the fact that real estate evolves and uh, takes forms that meets the needs of not only uh, the not only us uh, our, our people but also society and so uh, it's, it's amazing to me that we can continue to read his work and it's relevant and I think that uh, as a tribute very much uh, to know that the real estate that we've been taught at the program and the intersection of consumers producers and the public realm is emerging even more uh, importantly today so with that, I'd like to just kick off a little bit of the topics I'm going to discuss, um, kind of taking a little bit more of a, 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 a detailed dive than Mark on a couple of the property types. 
Um, but I'm just going to speak briefly to some near-term impacts on the different main commercial property types, office, residential, retail, and industrial. And then maybe talk a little bit more the midterm, long-term, kind of what we see kind of coming through the other side of the COVID impact in these property, same property uh, types. Then maybe a few comments on property markets and some general expectations on views uh, with respect to how different markets will fare given the impact of COVID. And then also would like to just make a couple additional brief comments on the future of the urban environment. Um, and, and one point I'd also like to make is, I think it's really important to know that none of us really know what's gonna happen, but, but if we can use our uh, our experiences, uh, as Mark described with 9-11, and our common sense, and, and also be sensitive uh, to what we're looking at in terms of what do people want in their space. Uh, real estate is going to come through this COVID uh, very efficiently, I also believe. Um, so with that, just to start, uh, just in terms of the near-term uh, expectation for property type impacts, and, and we'd love to hear through the chat as well uh, what you're seeing, uh, how you as the audience, you know, if you agree or disagree or you're seeing something else in this as well. But near term in office, uh, you know, we're definitely looking at the ability for property management and owners to reconfigure space, uh, to meet social distancing requirements. Uh, you're seeing floor markers, uh, different layouts, sanitation stations, staggered work hours, and, and the continued uh, uh, work from home impact for how we can, can operate our office spaces, perhaps at less than 100% um, occupancy. Briefly, an industrial over the near term, as Mark mentioned, it was in a very uh, a good balance of supply and demand uh, before and has been a strong property type over the last several years, uh, particularly in the U.S., but also globally. And we're still seeing leasing and tenant demand in um, industrial, and it's, it's not as labor intensive, so the impacts of social distancing have been a little bit easier to manage there. Uh, well, I'll, I'll also talk a little bit more, too, in terms of how the changes in the retail area flowing into industrial are actually creating a lot, a lot more need for additional industrial. In terms of apartments, once again, uh, you know, it's kind of the, 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 the stable property type generally. Um, rent collections in April and May for institutional quality real estate had been in the mid 90% range. We don't have June numbers yet, but uh, given the ability for people to have uh, working from home, uh, collecting some unemployment with unemployment bonuses, the $1,200 check mark mentioned, you know, we're seeing that apartments are generally over this, this near term uh, holding up well. And um, I think the key is going to be how, how things play out over the next several months and will they continue to, to retain uh, this, this, this favorable uh, performance. Finally, retail. Um, and retail is definitely experiencing significant uh, disruption. There were trends that were um, accelerating prior to COVID in terms of e-commerce, uh, challenged retail inline. Um, and, and rent collections, as Mark said, are, are very challenging there. Um, so I, I think there is some hope that there's going to be some additional reopenings this summer. Some movie theaters are talking about opening at 25, 50% capacity, but it really remains to be seen if, uh, if near term retail is going to be able to pull some of, pull some of this together and uh, gain any kind of ground. But I think it's also important to think about the more midterm and longer term uh, impacts in the property types, because that's that's really how do we come out on the other side of this uh, this COVID event and think about uh, if our property types need to meet certain tenant demands and societal needs. You know, how are we going to address some of these? And, and once again, no one knows exactly how this will play out, but I think there are some things that we can start to think about uh, that will be influencing us. So for example, uh, healthy building features are going to become more important to tenants. And even though some of their tenant, their, their uh, uh, workers will probably continue to do some work from home, uh, I, most people believe that there's going to be a, a blended uh, mix of working in the office, perhaps with less density, that that working on the bench with all all everyone shoulder to shoulder, probably it was it was starting to lose some um, 
attractiveness before COVID. You're probably going to see more space per employee in the office space, which will offset perhaps some of the contraction in office uh, that will occur because of the economic downturn. Um, we do expect weak leasing activity for new uh, leases, but, but there has been re renewal activity going on. So tenants are continuing to expect to stay in business. And any kind of space that's being delivered, we do expect vacancy will rise over the next two to three years, just given the general economic slowdown, because office space is very much affected by the overall economy. The evolution of co-working, that had also been in a precarious state before COVID. There is the, there's the expectation that it, it may evolve more to a more corporate managed uh, 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 pivot uh, option so that co-working will be more applicable and run by large property management firms to accommodate the shifting needs of their office tenants to either expand for a period of time or contract. And then finally in, in the office, we do see continued demand and, and outperformance in the biotech and life science sector. On the next slide, uh, just in terms of industrial, once again, um, the the different, the, the, the contracting economies globally will, will definitely impact industrial, but we do see that it had been in good balance with supply and demand. And as supply chains are shifting from a, say, China-based to a more local-based, you're gonna see additional demand in additional markets and e-commerce and some of the factors attributed to how goods are going to start to flow, logistics managers adopting just in case in inventories instead of just in time. There's gonna be a, a different, some different evolution of the uh, use of industrial and demand for industrial space. So there will be an expectation that is, for example, e-grocers, even though you will have, uh, you know, perhaps people not going to the grocery store and, and getting groceries delivered post COVID, uh, because they find that it's, it's efficient and, it, and they are willing to do it. You're, you're going to need closer in distribution sites, perhaps cold storage. There's just a lot of need and evolution expected in the industrial space that's going to evolve from the COVID based, um, event. Next on apartments, um, you know, we do expect it to be a reasonably stable performer. Uh, housing generally is it's a necessity. So we do need uh, to have to house our our, uh, our citizens. Uh, but there are challenges. You know, Mark talked about job losses and uh, we're, we're looking at forbearance. And generally speaking, uh, to date, we've been able to manage that well. But over it, it really depends on how long and deep the COVID event uh, goes from a health basis as to how it is going to impact the ability for apartment owners to uh, continue to collect rents. Um, it is a sector where landlords can adjust rents. So if they need to drop rents uh, to, to meet uh, weaker uh, demand or a weaker economic environment, that, that can be attained. And then as Mark mentioned, once again, the demographics uh, out there really do uh, lead to uh, the belief that apartments will continue to be an outperformer. And then finally, retail, poor retail. Um, it had been challenged before the COVID, as we talked about. Um, it's going through significant sec uh, structural changes in the sector. Uh, it's becoming less of a goods delivery space and really uh, morphing into an experiential, consumer-focused uh, type of real estate. And so it's, it, it's, it's expected that uh, retailers may morph to a a type of curbside online hybrid where they do have some uh, walk-in space, but then there's a, maybe a curbside or a uh, uh, e-commerce delivery element to the products. So the evolution here is just at the early stages, but COVID is definitely accelerating all the impacts to the retail environment. We don't know how consumer shopping habits are going to be permanently altered. Um, for example, after the 1918 uh, great influenza, the Spanish flu, it, it really took four or five years before people went back to theaters or went to restaurants. Uh, so, you know, obviously a different time, a hundred years ago, we have different technologies and health uh, advances, but still it, just no one knows how consumer shopping habits are going to react to this. And finally, in the mall segment of the uh, retail space, there was a significant challenge to this sector. It was very hard to transact and sell a mall over the past three years. Um, the COVID is expected to accelerate repurposing and reuse of the mall space as well. 
So with that, um, I would just like to speak a little bit to the um, the market impacts because we do expect that there, there's going to be a decline in new supply in all property types over the next two to three years. And as we mentioned, we were in we were in pretty good balance before the COVID event commenced. Uh, so the uh, the short term impacts uh, to different property markets are really going to be um, based on the rolling impact as COVID. Uh, reemerges in various locations and how that might then shut down the local economies and thus affect the local property markets. The other near-term impact for the um, for the COVID event is it, it just it's hard. It, it, the construction industry has been very challenged in just getting materials. Uh, the the way workers have to work with uh, social distancing requirements and um, protocols. Uh, just getting your permits and financing uh, done. So there, there are a lot of impacts that we think uh, could impact costs. And obviously, if it takes longer to build your property, it's going to cost more because you have more carry costs. And then in terms of real estate markets, um, you know, we do expect tech markets to come out of the COVID event in relatively good shape. Um, and I've mentioned a couple here, San Francisco, Seattle, Austin, Boston. Um, but tourism and service oriented markets are going to be, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be challenging because of the social distancing and, and how they rely on generating their, um, their economic activity. And then finally, I just would like to make a couple comments, um, not to repeat anything Mark said, but I, I also agree the city is not dead. Cities are and will continue to be attractive places to live, work, and 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 live and 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 thrive. So you, there's a concentration of talent for employers. There's the interconnectivity of of businesses and social structures, and the culture that Mark mentioned in terms of uh, museums, activities, um, and interacting with with our peers. People aren't inherently introverts. We are a social uh, race, and we need to um, be out of quarantine and enjoying uh, the cities and other parts of our lives. But I do think what will change is how we plan and deliver real estate. Um, I do believe there's going to be a continued emphasis and, and more of an emphasis on health and wellness and how we construct our buildings, uh, the type of uh, uh, fitness we encourage in all types of real estate for the occupants, um, and just the, the kinds of uh, HVAC and other systems that we incorporate into design to uh, uh, attract tenants that want to be in healthy buildings so that their employees uh, remain healthy. Uh, I do also think as uh, social reforms are another important factor that COVID has really, I think, brought to the forefront and hopefully will accelerate um, uh, how we use real estate to play a significant role in this is important with respect to how it can address housing, healthcare, education, um, and we can do that through zoning and legislation. Um, you're already seeing some areas start to talk about rent control and, and eviction moratoriums. And we currently have exactions, which uh, are, are funds that developers pay uh, when they build the project to subsidize social uh, uh, activities as such as housing um, or well-being. So I do think that that is going to be incorporated and become an, a very important part of the future of real estate. And then once again, uh, resiliency. Resiliency had been uh, important uh, to many uh, tenants, but it, it will become a, uh, a leading, uh, a, a leading uh, a theme in terms of uh, how people will focus on selecting the spaces they live. So once again, in summary, no one can predict outcomes and trends, but I do think that uh, we come back to the intersection and interplay of the three constituents in how we go forward with our real estate development. And those are the consumers, the producers, and the public realm. Those are uh, items espoused by the chief 40, 50 years ago. So I would just share with you a closing quote from the chief uh, at the end of his monograph. And really, real estate does affect all of uh, our community and society. Um, so once again, his words being very relevant and important, and we will get through this. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to Mike. Jill and Mark, thank you for a very interesting program and I uh, appreciate the references back to the chief. I suspect we have a few audience members who uh, might have had some familiarity with the chief as well. Uh, and they'll probably have some good questions, but I'm going to start out by pressing you a little bit on one of the issues we talked about, which is 
the future of the city. And I agree with you, there are a lot of great benefits to being in a city, the agglomeration economies, but of course, the virtual world has gotten better and better because of the experience that we're in. I think all of us grew up in an in-person world and we wanna go back to that. But I look at kids today, you know, they spend a lot of their time engaging with their friends virtually versus in person. Um, and I'm not so sure that for them, it's gonna be as natural to, um, you know, go into the city environment and be as attracted to, you know, the high density environment. Um, you know, and I've, I've read some people who think, you know, live sports will be challenged coming out of this. Again, technology is getting better and better. People for a while have talked about, oh gosh, it's really pretty nice to watch a football game in my home, have my friends over, it takes less time, it's a lot less expensive, et cetera. So um, I wanna push you on that a little bit because I think COVID is a shock that could last for quite a while. And when people change their behavior long enough, they get new habits. When you get new habits, you can get new preferences. What do you think about that? Are you really that certain that we're going to go, things will just go back the way they were as soon as we get a vaccine? Or will we see people's preferences really change a little bit? Well, I can, I'll start out with a, a quick response. I'll look to Jill. Um, and I'll use the university as an example. So what we've seen is um, after spring break, we, we all uh, went um, virtual. We all went online. Now, these were remote teaching sessions. They weren't all together online, which is a, 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 a formulaic way of, of teaching um, uh, virtually. But that said, I think we did a pretty good job. I think you can educate remotely somewhat well, if not very well, uh, using today's technology. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm running against my own word. But, 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 but at the same time, I think what's critically important in the university setting, and this applies to cities, it applies to uh, uh, economies and, and companies, is while you can do some of that work, you can be productive at home. In the end, where do you innovate? Uh, when we start looking at the lost opportunities in the, it, from our student perspective, it is around the co-curricular activities. We take students on, 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 on field trips. We, take, we have um, uh, a different uh, career fairs. Uh, we have speakers come in. All these things just aren't the same, as well as the person-to-person the, the, the -person interaction. So I think, um, individuals can be fairly productive um, and maybe some line um, jobs can, can move out. But I strongly believe how we cluster and how we work together uh, and collaborate is really how we innovate in this country and, and, and more, more, more broadly in the world. And cities are the places where that gets done. Great answer. Jill, anything to add to that? I would, there, there are a couple different points. I think that one of the areas that that's been interesting to observe is how difficult it is to do online education for three to five year olds. I mean, you need, there, there, there are certain, there are certain things that we just can't do virtually and we just can't do online. And, 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 and I think that's the generation you're talking about, Mike, they're very adept at iPhones and iPads and they watch uh, a lot of things, but they still like to, you know, go to their music groups in person and, uh, you know, be outside at a playground with other people. And so I think, you know, that very youngest crowd, I, I, I just think that the connectivity of people with people is something that's very important um, for us as, a, as, a, as humans. But, but as you get older, I guess just from a, um, just from a, will we go back to exactly how it was? You know, after 9-11, we all got back on planes and we went through the um, the x-ray machines and and we, we we followed the rules on the plane. I think I think there will be we may wear masks more. Um, I mean, when you went if, if you traveled in Asia, there it's a pretty common thing. We, we may pick up, I think, some of the uh, the social distancing and protective elements, but but I do think that when you come right down to it, to go to a live sporting event, to go to a live concert, um, to uh, gather with your family for a wedding, those are all really important social things that I do think we will go back to because that's just part of, of how we um, thrive as, as a race. I'm, I'm definitely with you on the weddings. We're not gonna be doing virtual weddings very long. <laughs> so uh, we got a question, audience question from Osita. Uh, she says, I was one of 
14 bids on a residential home yesterday. I bid 25,000 over list and I wasn't the winning bidder. How long will the residential market be this crazy? Well, I don't know. I don't know what percent 25K was of this bid, but you know, there you have it. We bid over and didn't get the house. What do you think? Um, I'll, I'll jump on that first as I present a little more on the single family residential. The uh, single family residential market will continue to be supply constrained. And in this COVID environment, what happened was some um, segments of the market uh, actually pulled homes out of uh, for sale. Most people didn't want um, other individuals walking through their house, so they pulled their, market, their, their properties off the market. So it created even a greater shortage of properties for sale. Uh, and now with interest rates at arguably all time lows approaching 3% and may even be below that for a 30 year mortgage in the coming weeks. Um, people want to, people want to buy that house. And also there's this, this uh, there's a little bit of an immediacy of a push, especially for those who are living in a smaller apartment in a downtown area. And we're looking to buy as well. This was the push because they now want to get out from that, that really confining space into something larger. In short, um, Osita, I can't, provide you with a uh, positive news. I think this tightness in the market will remain for, for any number of years for, because of demographics, because of aging in place, uh, as, as well as a lack of new houses coming online and lack of adequate number of houses. You know, Mark, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say too that we never really caught up from the GFC? Uh, there was a huge decline in, there, there was just a lack of delivery of single family homes and it never really caught up given the demographic trends that you mentioned. I, I just think that we're also kind of suffering from that um, as well. Uh, there's been a supply imbalance for a while. Yeah, the shortage is probably 3 million units. So you're right on. Yeah. And that's another reason resi um, residential rentals um, are expected to be okay is because we just aren't delivering enough housing units to accommodate people. And you still have that uh, cohort that hasn't moved out from home. Uh, too many of them living at home. I have some. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a good time to invest in an apartment building? Just kidding. Uh, question from James. You can come back to that later if you would. Question from James. Can you talk a little bit more about the future of traditional shopping malls? How might they return or be redeveloped? Jill, I'll let you start on that one. I mean, there are some malls that are going to survive. Uh, there are some of these, uh, you know, they're 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 just uh, they're 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 class A. They have great uh, experiential elements to them, which are important to shoppers. Um, so, so I, I guess I won't say that all malls will be gone, but we we are over retailed. We have too much retail in the United States compared to I think anywhere in the world. And so the traditional shopping mall, there's just too many malls, too many malls and not enough tenants, uh, too many malls that they aren't catering to what people need today, which is, isn't walking around like you did in the 70s and 80s. You can go online and get something. Um, you know, it's it just, they're not, they're, there's too many of them and they're not really uh, set up to serve consumer demand. So I do think the future of many of them is that they will be redeveloped. And some of them are in great locations. They have good uh, proximity to major transportation networks. Um, uh, they're usually uh, well located to intersections of interstates and in demographic areas where there are good underlying um, community uh, in income factors that could support, say, residential development, maybe medical uh, office type development, some health care. Uh, so I do think that there's going to be a redevelopment that will be accelerated. Uh, just think about all those parking lots. It's a lot of land. And um, so I think the future of the mall is there's going to be a barbell. It's just going to be there are going to be a few malls that are these mega dominant malls, and then the rest, I think, will over time just be redeveloped. So I did my dissertation on the economics of regional shopping malls. So how much time do you have? <laughs> um, <laughs> Not that much. <laughs> what was that? Two years? <laughs> We're wrapping up at eight. No. Couple, a couple of really quick and, and uh, quick comments on that. So what you have in a regional mall is you have anchors. Anchors create a draw to bring in. Um, uh, customers, and then those customers spill over into the smaller shops. Um, 
the, the anchor tenants are department stores or historically were department stores where they had electronics and sporting goods and men's and women's and so forth. But what happened over time, and, and they ended up being a nice complement for the inline retailers. What happened over time are two things. First off, they're not department stores anymore. They really are a lot of soft goods stores, so they're more competing with the inline retailers instead of complementing them. And here's the other thing. The really important thing about a Nordstrom's in a mall is it reduces search and information costs. We go to a mall so we can see, uh, let's say for shoes, Nordstrom's good at that, a, a range of prices and qualities and colors and fashions on shoes, and you're going to get them all at the mall. You, you only have one stop shop and you got them all there. Where do we where do we go for our search now? It's the internet. So we no longer need the, the department store in, 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 this, in this model because we're doing that search and information um, online. So the, the purpose of the mall and the way it was originally constructed is not purposeful in today's world in the same way. And so the traditional mall has some significant challenges overcoming that. They still will be great places where people want to go and be entertained. But as far as the idea of, of conveying goods, it's got to be a quick in and a quick out with um, very narrow types of goods. Think Lululemon. I know what they sell. That's all they sell. They sell it well. I'm going to go in there and get that. But I think it'll be very challenged, the traditional mall. Great answer. Um, there's a question from John uh, directed to Mark, which I fear you may disagree with John's premise. With the exodus we are seeing from big cities, thank you, John, are people leaving less likely to be home buyers? Oh, the people leaving cities, are they less likely to be home buyers? Um, I think that the big move, generally speaking, is you 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 get your first job in a city. Think about graduating from the great state University of Wisconsin. Where do you want to go? You want to go to Chicago. You want to go to Minneapolis. You want to go to one of the big cities. And you want to live downtown. You get married and you move out. And that move out usually means um, married children. And I'm thinking traditional. We can go um, alternative as well. But it's a similar thing whereby you likely will uh, buy a home. Um, uh, the that model will likely continue um, uh, for most, but I think we have significant challenges uh, when it comes to wealth and income inequality. I think in the past, uh, housing was available for most levels of income. I think it's going to more narrowly become uh, housing for those who are of, of greater means. Um, and I, I hate to say that. Um, so your point is well taken. I'm not sure I answered it though. But I'm, I'm not sure I would agree that there's an exodus. I, I, I think that to Mark's point, there's a demographic wave moving through that naturally as they have children and move out to find a school system, they might go to the suburbs and then they buy a house typically I'd say. But, but I'm not sure that those, we've been four months into this and if there are people that are leaving New York City that are buying a house two hours out because they're going to commute once a week to the city. I let's see in two years if they go back. I, I don't know that that it's a big enough trend of migration yet, and and I think we have to be able to look back in a couple years and see it. If people are moving out, are they staying out? Um, I mean, before COVID, we actually had a significant amount of uh, people moving into the uh, Boston uh, urban area. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's not just the downtown core, the CBD, these inner suburb, they're, 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 they're part of the city, but they're, they're kind of a little inner suburban. And, and that I think is going to be a big beneficiary of this because you could, can, you could maybe get a yard, but you're still, you know, 30 minutes from the, from the workplace. What's the impact of COVID on multi-unit residential housing? in terms of say occupancy rates, sales prices, et cetera, will the multi-unit residential um, face a little bit of a decline in demand because of this? People be less, uh, find, find apartment buildings less desirable? So the National Association of, um, or the Multifamily Housing Council tracks uh, rental payment. 
And uh, for the most part, they're seeing about a one and a half percent decline in, in, in payments. So a delinquency rate increase of one and a half percent. I'm on two different uh, real estate um, private equity boards. And both of those have for their class A units, almost no difference at all um, in the um, delinquency rates. And for the A class, for the B class, they're seeing two to 3% uh, additional uh, delinquency rates. So that hasn't impacted it a, a, a whole lot. Uh, as far as the pricing, I believe there'll be plenty of debt and equity that still wanna chase that uh, property type and the prices will largely be maintained. I look forward to Jill, Jill's response on this one as well. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, you know, we've seen rent collections um, in the mid nineties, occupancy staying pretty stable. Um, it, it can vary market by market, of course, but there had been a trend over the past several years, Mark probably knows the statistics better than I do, um, that, that more and more people are choosing to rent, that they don't want to be a homeowner. They don't want the maintenance, the taxes, the uh, stickiness. They, they would rather uh, rent. So I, I just think rent, rental housing and COVID, COVID is a, a health issue. Um, obviously apartments have to deal with it. They've had to shut down their, um, their workout spaces, their common area party spaces, and other amenities that were, you know, really valued by renters. But but in general, I would say we really expect that COVID is going to, you know, suppress performance over the near term, but but not significantly influence the performance of the sector long term. I, I think people are going to be more renters by choice. Those those trends I think are going to continue. Great. Um, a question from John directed at Jill, is international investment in the real estate market here likely to decline, stay the same or increase? I mean, we are a connected world. I think it kind of what it's going to depend on how the political um, realm evolves everywhere. It's not just the US, um, but I think in general, international investing before COVID had, had been, um, it's been increasing because people are more and more comfortable with the ability to understand different markets, partner with different local developers. I mean, real estate is a local business. So typically if you are investing in a different market, you're partnering with someone or you're working with someone that gives you that local insights and intelligence. Um, so I, I think it's going to continue. We may have a period here over the next several years where just the, the politics of, of being isolationists impact a little bit. Um, but long term, I think the world is connected and we're connected by air, we're connected by economies and culture and, and, and real estate. I mean, there are parts of the world that the real estate's been around for thousands of years. I think we should be looking at it. So. All right. Um, a question from Alan. Uh, what type of REITs are the safest? I've got a couple of quick suggestions. There's some triple net REITs which really invest in uh, properties with just really the income stream. A second one would be data centers right now. There's tremendous demand for de data centers and it's difficult to construct them. Uh, being the two, um, they're a little bit not core. Uh, of the core, I would go with industrial and some apartments. Some apartments are focused on one market, like maybe San Francisco or Atlanta. It's gonna be very much dependent upon that market. Jill? Um, I think that there is risk in everything. Um, and I agree with Mark on the industrial sector, because as a sector, it's it's got the best risk uh, return characteristics and the uh, industrial REITs are, are very well run. Um, that being said, a lot of the uh, REIT uh, industry is, is very well run. So um, I think it comes down to, if you're looking for no risk, it's probably not a place to be like, <laughs> I go buy a treasury, um, so. Put it under your pillow. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna take one more question because we're coming up on the top of the hour and then I'll give you guys the opportunity for some final thoughts. Um, this is from Craig, directed at Mark, but Jill, I'm sure you'll have something to say about it. There are so many large, uh, and by that he proposes uh, 5K plus, square foot homes on the market these days that can't be sold. Do you think they'll be sold for a big price cut or are these uh, areas gonna be doomed to be raised because nobody wants them? 
Ooh, um, great question, uh, Craig. Um, Before in, you raise them, I'd like one opportunity to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think raising, there's a price, right? Yeah, raising sounds a little bit extreme, right? Uh, and I, I would suggest that. But um, I think what's happened, it goes to behaviors of the next generation of home buyers, which are millennials. Many of them are raised, were raised in these large suburban homes, and they didn't like the lack of culture that they got out in some of these pretty remote suburbs. Um, and so they are eschewing that opportunity themselves and would prefer being in the first ring um, uh, uh, suburbs and, and uh, uh, going there. Some of the large single family homes around Chicago as a good example, have had a difficult time selling. Um, I think some of that will continue. I would, just, I would just comment briefly that I think if we as a society are going to um, be environmentally conscious and, and be looking at resiliency and, and try to develop thoughtfully. Uh, I, I think that large, big houses in big lots far out are just not gonna be the, the norm. And that doesn't mean that everywhere is gonna be the same. There are gonna be places where people will want a large uh, place on a lot of land. But but I think by and large, I think the bigger trend is going to be, as Mark described, uh, you know, um, uh, efficient uh, homes that are um, perhaps close on smaller lots, but that they are a lot of common uh, open space and uh, ex uh, experiential amenities in the area. And that's going to be valued, I think, a lot more uh, by people than the amount of square footage. Great. So uh, I'm going to give you each a chance for a few concluding thoughts, and I'll I'll start with Mark. Okay. Um, so overall, I think what uh, Jill and I spoke to was the the fact that we will likely have a vaccine, um, and as well as we'll have safe distancing, we'll end up having a setting that doesn't look all that different, although uh, with deeper impl implications than maybe the 9/11 terrorist attacks. Uh, as once these uh, issues are resolved, we will likely go back to um, enjoying our urban areas and our urban environment. Um, one thing I'd like to have you think about um, as I depart um, um, is the idea of what I'm calling urban, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Uber distance or maybe even autonomous uh, vehicle distance and neither are distances. So at one point, most people wanna be walking distance from a set of amenities from where their house or residence is. Um, and an Uber distance allows you to be a little further away. An Uber distance is not a measure of distance, but it's how quickly you get an Uber and the cost of that Uber. So can I quickly get to where I wanna go with an Uber? Um, as we look into the future, five and seven years from now, we can distance a little bit better, but the likelihood of having autonomous vehicles in far more places in, in really changing the way we look at our urban environment. This could actually reduce some of the, the core urban area de demand as we go forth, as we look out into another five or seven years, a little bit less about, about COVID. Um, overall, when it comes to the commercial real estate markets though, coming back to that issue, I think they're in, in, in fairly good shape, but you really do wanna look at property type by property type with hospitality and retail really being challenged. Um, I think single family will, will come back and I, I, I fear a little bit by saying this, but come roaring back and 2021 will be a great year for the Realtors and we'll see tremendous price appreciation, which is great for those who own a home and not so good uh, for those who would like to get in and, and, and buy a home. Jill. I would just uh, conclude by saying this too will pass. Uh, it's, a health, uh, it's a health challenge and a health emergency but we will come out the other end and real estate is a cyclical business. Our economy goes in cycles. And I think it's really critical to have a view that is looking forward and looking out. Um, I think that this will give us some tools to improve how we build, how we make great spaces, how we make healthy spaces and all of that is a good thing. Uh, so I do think we're gonna come out the other side. We're in relatively good shape in the real estate uh, industry, uh, although as Mark said, hospitality and uh, some retail is gonna be significantly challenged by this, but 
by and large, I think we're in very good position to come out the other side of COVID in very good shape and um, and have some good takeaways and lessons learned that, that will help us all over the long term. Great. Well, I would like to thank you both, Mark and Jill, for joining us tonight. Uh, great to have two Grass Camp alums on the program talking real estate and uh, appreciate the references to the chief and his teachings. Uh, one of the great things that, you know, I never got to meet the chief, but coming to, to Wisconsin and hearing about him was uh, something I'll never forget, you know, uh, the way people would talk about what they learned from him and his holistic view about the world. So uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, appreciate all the great audience questions we had. Uh, we'll take next week off. Uh, we're not going to have a program on July 7th, but we'll be back on the 14th with a vengeance. Uh, thank you. Have a great evening.